planning date trials at, uh, in this case, this is four sites in north, central and northern Illinois, and we have four dates at each one, and I just took those and converted them to percent of the highest yielding planting time, so within each trial. So you can see it's usually the earliest planting that gives us the highest yields, and in some cases it isn't, but most of the time it is. And then over that, all of those, I just ran a line through those, and I put the little inset table there where you can see after each period, for example, by May the 30th, we've lost about 15% of our yield, and that's about 10 bushel. The, uh, the maximum, average maximum yield in these trials was about 66 or 67 bushel per acre, so pretty good. And so that's sort of on a general sense. So I'll put this together and you know, this will be sort of our, when people always wonder, well, how much yield are we losing? We all know that we don't have much control over when this, when planting gets done. All of you are equipped to plant fast and we can plant, we can plant fast. We're always held up by soils being too wet. And that's what our, that's why we plant on average we get done if you, if you wonder what it is for corn, by the way, our average 50% planted date for the corn crop is about May 1st. Actually, it's a little bit after May 1st. So we, 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 our ideal planting times are hard to attain most years for everybody. Some of you probably get to them quicker than others. So that's kind of that. Sometimes early planting works really well, and this was in Urbana in 2014, where for every day we delayed after about April the 26th, and if we had planted earlier, we probably would have had 100 bushel yield. It cost us about a half a bushel, but that's kind of an unusual response. It's more often a little bit like this, where it didn't really matter if you were middle of April or early May, they both yielded about 90 in this case, and then it kind of drifted off after that. And this was one in last year at Monmouth where, you know, it went, you could go from the middle of April to almost the end of May before you lost uh, more than six, seven bushel. So sometimes it doesn't make that much difference. Can you plant too early ever? Well, I'll show you a couple cases where you, we can sort of say we can. This is when it's really cold earlier and plants seem to get hardened off somehow and never really be, have the ability to come back and yield. Here's where it was very dry early in 2012 over here in Pike County, or down in Pike County, and the later you planted, the better the yields were. <laughs> I should say not only dry early, but uh, good rainfall later in the season. And for the early planted ones, it was too late to do it much good. And here's one that's probably a little more common than either of those first two, although it's still not very common in Illinois, and this is where SDS basically took out any early planting yield advantage. This was a study in Monmouth in 2014. There was a lot of sudden death syndrome there. Uh, Angie, who you heard earlier today, uh, took these ratings there. And basically you see the yield was completely flat over those three planting dates. And the amount of SDS went from above 80% down to about uh, less than 15% for those different planting dates. The good news is it didn't really hurt the yields to plant them early, but it certainly did not help them. And I think the early advantage was just taken away here by the disease. So that's kind of the story on, you know, can you plant too early? And in practical terms, I tell people, plant your corn first, start your soybeans as soon as you're done with corn, and, um, and you'll be in good shape. And I think that still holds okay. Our planting response to corn is a little bit more penalty than with soybeans, although our recent data are showing a little bit less of that. But, um, you know, it's not that, that soybeans taken a second place or something behind corn in this case. It's just a question that corn is a little more sensitive to late planting than soybeans is. Seeding rate is a mess. <laughs> we, we started up work, we had a pretty decent database from a few years ago. And we were pretty confident, although Southern Illinois, and I'm not showing you those data, but Southern Illinois showed it really needed a little more seed. And then we did another <clears throat> seeding rate study a couple years ago. 
with three sites and two locations where we had a range of rates. And we actually found in both of those cases that you needed about 150,000 seeded to get to the best yields. And we restarted this last year, and we're gonna do it again this year. Uh, these are in 30 inch rows, because people have asked me before today, and we, we do these alongside our variety trials, and we're just addicted to 30 inch rows with these because we have a row crop header and we don't want to give it up and they don't make them for 30, 15 inch rows. So that's where we're at with these. I don't think that 15 inch rows would respond very differently than this. They might have a little higher yield. But these are, you know, there's some real oddities here. One oddity is that Monmouth one, the, the Urbana one, which you can see in there by color, um, you know, that's pretty typical and we needed 120,000 plants or something with that one, maybe a little, 110,000. So three of these had that, that circle, that's where the maximum yield was reached. There are about 100,000 plants. Two of them are way higher than that. <laughs> the Monmouth one, the yellow line, is you can see it was a straight line just going up the whole time. Now these are actual stands. We seeded 50, 100, 150, and 200,000 in these trials, in all of them. And we can count that out pretty well. We have a precision planter that we use. So a couple of them were sort of normal. The, the one at the bottom there had about a 50% stand. So we barely got up to the, to the maximum yield there and maybe didn't even quite by the highest the population we had. And then the really strange one was that one at New Berlin that reached 90 bushel at a population of somewhere about 60, 65,000 plants. The highest yield with the lowest plant population. Well, we aren't gonna make too much of this, but I think when I take the lines away and just show you this and say, okay, what seeding rate do you need? <laughs> what do you say? A couple things have happened with soybean seed. It's much better, it's, it's treated better, harvested more carefully, seed treatments. It's a better package than it was 20 years ago. So we can be a lot more confident that when we plant soybean seed, you know, 80 of those that I showed you, you know, those are, if you take them as percent of what we planted, except for that El Elkville site in Southern Illinois where it rained two inches the night we planted it. And believe me, that's always gonna be a, a problem. But you know, we average between 80 and 90% stands. And our old rule of thumb was, you know, maybe 80% would be an average. I think today the average is more in the 85 to 90%. It's not always gonna be that, but certainly we have more confidence today that a soybean seed is gonna come up and produce a plant than we would have back uh, years ago. But we've also had people saying, well, you can, plan, you can get away with planting 100,000 or even, I heard somebody say 80,000. No, you can't. <laughs> you know, we really, sometimes, we often enough need more plants than that, that we cannot be planting 100,000 seeds. Oh, we can, but you're not gonna, you're gonna lose some yield in some cases. I look at this and, uh, you know, we're gonna do it again this year and we might add neonicotinoid these were seed treated with everything that, except we didn't use a levo on them, but they were seed treated and so this year we might do some with and without the neonicotinoid because it's become kind of an issue. But I look at this and say I think we ought to be planting that 140,000 seeds or so that we consider a unit today and I think that's about where we should be. I'll ask a series of questions here of uh, different inputs. This one is the narrow row response, and that is do they, do they respond more at the high yields? Because remember, we're talking about high yields, making high yields higher today. And the answer, although I put the line in there and it kind of looks like it might be a yes, it's not much of a yes. In other words, our response to 15 inch rows here was pretty consistent across yield levels. And we had some big responses at 40 bushel yields and we had some big responses at 80 bushel yield. And so on average, you can see up there in the corner, we had 2.1 bushel higher yields over these 
trials. There's, uh, I don't know, 35 trials here, and 20 of them were significant. Of those 20, one of them was a significant yield decrease with narrow rows. That's that one down there below minus four, and I don't have any explanation for that. Of the things that I'm going to show you, this has been the most consistent in terms of increasing yield, is narrow rows. We've had a little bit of tendency to reduce, uh, to move 20, uh, 15s to 30s as people get 24-row planters or 36-row planters. And so, you know, I'm, I don't tell people, well, that's a dumb thing to do. Don't go back to 30-inch rows. I say you have to probably be able to justify two bushel lower yield if you're going to do it. And some people will do that. And some people will simply say, well, as one farmer said, we went to 30s and we didn't lose yield at all. Okay, you should believe what you're doing in what you're doing, and I guess if you can just believe it, then it's true. <laughs> uh, obviously, nobody's really going to check once they make the decision, but it certainly doesn't mean that you shouldn't be going to those, but I think you ought to pencil in a two bushel lower yield just on average. <clears throat> Fungicide and insecticide is a more difficult one. You know, these are 28 trials and it takes today about four bushel of yield to, to pay for a fungicide aerial application. And you can see here that maybe a fourth of these produced about four bushel or, or higher. And, uh, it's just, it's, and it certainly doesn't have any relationship to what the yield level is. So fun, I'm not going to stop and, and harangue you about fungicide and insecticide. We're almost always putting these on without having any idea that there's a disease or insect there that these are going to control. First of all, diseases and insects in, the, in July or early August when you'd put these on are not very common. Certainly not fungal diseases that a fungicide would fix. So if you have SDS showing up, don't expect a fungicide to affect it. So that's sort of the story on that. I do think that fungicides can have physiological effects sometimes. We don't know how to predict when that's going to happen. It's possible that there are subclinical, you know, low levels of diseases that really don't show up, but the fungicide does something and we may never see it, but it actually can increase yield that way. For whatever reason, you know, on average here, we're seeing some yield increases, but they're not consistent, and on average, they don't pay for themselves. You know, everything there that's, you know, half of these points are two bushel or less. They very seldom produce a yield loss, which I guess we could feel good about. Um, insecticides are probably a little bit more controversial. Um, I don't know where that habit grew up, putting insecticides in, but most of the planes that fly fungicide and insecticide on. And one farmer told me one time, he said, I think it's the insecticide that does the good. Well, I'm not showing you data today, but based on everything we've done, it actually is not the insecticide that does the good. It's the fungicide. I don't think we've ever put insecticide on and seen a yield increase. Well, you would if you had aphid outbreak or something like that, but we haven't, I haven't dealt with those. Yeah. Are you at liberty to say which fungicide? Yeah, that's a good question, which fungicide? And somebody asked me that earlier. I would be at liberty if I remembered. Um, they aren't all the same one. Okay. They all are strobilier and fungicide of some sort. I pretty much, yeah, after, flower, after flowering, sort of a R2, R3. Regardless of symptoms or non-symptoms. That's correct. These are put on just because we were putting them on, it was in the, on the sheet. If you waited until you had something, what, how long would you wait <laughs> most of the time? I mean, for insects, we know the answer to that. You know, aphid outbreaks, there were some back there, but you know, the, I used to give our entomologists grief because I said, just because they, you, they had this idea that every two years we'd be seeing aphids and that pretty much has gone away. We're just seeing low numbers now. And the, the rust never showed up. <laughs> you know, that was one of the reasons we started getting fungicide in is because we were going to get rust. And it it's showed up, but never here. 
and it won't. Um, what's your average? What, what's the average response overall? Over these? Yeah, I mean, over these? Oh, I should have put the number up there, but you can look at those and pretty much come up. It's been two, two and a half, somewhere in there. Just of those, just looking at the points. <clears throat> So it's still a little bit of a conundrum, you know, but I'm still troubled a little bit, both in corn and soybean, by people that say, before they even plant, that it's part of their routine management now, they're gonna put fungicide on. You know, when soybeans were $15, I could kind of understand that. You know, we were gonna make a lot of money no matter what we did. <clears throat> Today, I'm not too sure we can do that. Carl Bradley did the work, of course, showing that we have some fungal diseases, frog eye leaf spot that's becoming resistant to strobilia and fungicides. And, uh, you know, that hasn't been the degree of alarm we've had with insects or, or, uh, or weeds, but it's certainly something to think about. So I'm not going to move us very far on that one. Nitrogen remains a, a controversial topic, and these were before 2015. Uh, this was sort of what I was showing as our response over 33 trials. Our average response to nitrogen was barely above zero, and it was not higher at higher yields. The theory on this got started a number of years ago. Somebody did a review. They said, well, it's possible that when you get soybean yields above 70 or so, that that's when they can have trouble fixing their own nitrogen and still making high yields and that's where you ought to get the response to, fun, to nitrogen applications in season. That's what we did. What did we find? <laughs> you know, I added the 2014 data in, which was a couple of those higher points up there, the one on the right, the two on the upper right there, and that pulled that line up. Before that, it was actually a negative line. Statistically, a significant negative line showing the higher the yields, the less response you got to nitrogen application. Now it's kind of a nothing line, but it's still sloping downward, as you can see. So I thought we ought to move beyond just the blind application of nitrogen and try to figure out what was going on. So we did a trial this last year. We didn't have any funding for it. I just did it because I felt like it. And uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to do anything this year because it was a costly trial and because um, we did a lot of analyses. And I'm not going to show you much of this because I, he just came in and I think that was, I think that meant that was that finger and it meant to keep going or to finish up. But uh, anyway, we took soil samples and plant samples to see how much nitrogen was present under either a check treatment or ones where we had added nitrogen fertilizer. And we pulled out all our stops here. We used 100 pounds of nitrogen at each time and our maximum amount we put on was four applications of 100 pounds each. And we did it at four locations. So I'm not gonna stop on that one very long. This is, we had a treatment in there, kind of a unique one, where we didn't put a crop. We just put some nitrogen treatments or none on, and we found out how much nitrogen the soil had in. We were trying to see what the soil contribution of nitrogen would be. I won't show you that one because it's all takes too long, but this is the, cr the soil where we had the crop present. And you can kind of see the check there is that orange bar kind of goes down. You know, if you get under 50 pounds of nitrogen, that means that something has been taking it up, and that's exactly what was happening. The crop was taking it up. Then it bounced around a little at the end. And the, the line to the far right, the light colored one, is where we put it on four times. And notice there at R8, which is maturity, how much soil nitrogen we had. We had 200 pounds of soil nitrogen in that treatment at maturity. Where do you suppose that nitrogen is today? It's, it's in the Mississippi somewhere down probably towards New Orleans today. Um, you know, it doesn't stick around. And that's one of our concerns about nitrogen on soybean. If the crop doesn't need it or doesn't take it all up, it's going to go. And we're talking about nutrient loss reduction. It does not <laughs> include an endorsement of putting nitrogen on soybeans that may not need it. 
This is how much the plants had in them. And without stopping too long on this, at R6 there, that full, pot, full seed stage, probably late August, in this case, we had about 400 pounds of nitrogen just in the plants themselves without whether we added any as fertilizer or not. This just is the plant and soil together, and I just put them together like this to show you what the impressive numbers were. The one on the left hand is the set of bars where you see R6, no nitrogen. That's about 500 pounds of nitrogen in that system, soil and plant without any addition of fertilizer. Where do you suppose that nitrogen all came from? Great majority of it was fixed by the plant. And so if we added nitrogen fertilizer, you can see the taller orange bars there over on the right. If we added nitrogen fertilizer, we added nitrogen to the system, but what? <laughs> well, quite a bit of it was still in the soil, not in the plant. <clears throat> this was our yield response in that trial. We had a yield de decrease for putting nitrogen on at planting time. We had an increase if we put it on two times or four times, that R3 plus R5 and the one next to it. Both of those gave a five bushel yield increase over the check. 200 pounds and five bushel are, does not compute <laughs> to a profit. That would be a loss. We put ammonium sulfate in as a sulfur source. We wanted to see if we'd get a response to that. We didn't. And I put Coron on at R6 just to see if we'd get a response to foliar nitrogen, and we didn't with that either. So that's the story on that. Here's one at Chillicothe, irrigated soybeans up north of here on sand in the uh, outwash from the Illinois. And you can see here we got a huge increase, over 20 bushel increase, by putting nitrogen on at planting time. It's a very sandy soil, low organic matter. And it was only the planting time one that really did us much good. Um, you can see we've got the R1, R3, R5. Those all gave, uh, look like a yield increase. Statistically it isn't over the check. Um, and ammonium sulfate kind of dinged the yield. They put it on when it, leaves were a little wet from dew. That's a really bad idea. Don't ever try that at home. Not the granular stuff. Uh, so that, that did damage at a couple of the sites this last year. But the increase was from the planting time. We put it on four times, we got the same yield as putting it on at planting, but that included putting it on at planting. So it's pretty clear that the boost in this case came from the planting time ap op, uh, application. And that just shows you nitrogen levels. So the only thing I'll point out is the no nitrogen over there on the left. Notice that it only has about 300 pounds of nitrogen now at its ma at, at R6. And if you look at the nitrogen at planting next to it there, that has of over 400 pounds. That 100 pounds we put on at planting, <laughs> it boosted the nitrogen of the plant by about 100 pounds by the time we got to late season. So here was Monmouth. This is much more typical of what we've seen in the past. We could strong arm a yield increase from this by putting it on five times 400 pounds of nitrogen, but it was only three and a half bushel. It was significant though. And the, the loss in economic loss would have been significant as well. And this was at Brownstown where we just got a different result. South Central Illinois, a lower organic matter soil with clay pan. We did get a yield increase there, but it came from the R3 application. That's a late July application. And you can see here that we also got a yield decrease from planting time application and from the four times application. So it wasn't happy to get that planting time application at that site either. So we'll finish up with that. You know, we haven't, I'm really curious about some of these things. My goal in this was to try to find a way that the soybean crop could reveal, <laughs> you know, if it can benefit from nitrogen fertilizer. But we really do have to be cautious about that, yes. Does uh, soybeans add nitrogen to the soil as a legume for the next year's corn crop? The answer, the question, do soybeans add nitrogen? The answer is generally, I was gonna go back here to take a look. Generally, the answer to that is no. So if we had, 
This is with, this is without this is without plants. So the amount of nitrogen here with uh, with no plant, sorry, this is without plants. This is the crop, the, no, the soil with no nitrogen. That's how much nitrogen it had in it at the end. And the, where you had a plant, it had this much. It actually used up nitrogen that was in the soil. Soybeans do not, according to, contrary to popular thought, leave behind nitrogen for the next crop. They take up nitrogen that they find most of the time. If we're going to fertilize them, we get this kind of thing where we're going to leave a lot of that behind in some cases. So no, uh, we don't know any reason why the soybean would fix more nitrogen than it needs. And we don't think that it does. We've done irrigation and looked at these inputs there, nitrogen, micronutrients, fungicide, insecticide inside of irrigation with and without. We don't find irrigation making much difference in the response to these inputs. And somewhat surprisingly, we often don't find irrigation to be making that much difference in yield. In 2012, it made about a nine bushel uh, increase in yield. In 2013 and 2014, it was much less than that. <laughs> And on average, you can see there, we only added about six bushel or so to y of yield on average over those three years. And this is the last ones. I'm not going to stop in any detail on these or time is up, but these are some sort of systems trial where we put lots of stuff on, everything we could think of. And then in some cases, we took some pieces of that out to see what difference that would make in yield. And my bottom line on all of this, I'll show you here in the next couple slides is, it's really hard to get any kind of consistent yield increase by putting on bunches of inputs. You know, we, the top line there is everything, and I mean everything. We had all kinds of stuff on this. Uh, everything we could think of probably cost $150 an acre. And we not only put everything on, but we put everything on twice. Because we were gonna make blame sure and you can see putting it on twice there boosted our yields by over a bushel. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, you know, and taking away nitrogen and taking stuff and adding stuff by itself, it's just hard to move the yields in a consistent basis. The only thing we found that moved them in a consistent basis was Cobra, and it decreased them. It's been one of our most consistent inputs, almost always negative. And this is just more of the same. Soya was this trial. This was our everything package. And uh, yielded 64. And if we took out things one at a time, we really couldn't, we didn't drop yields. And when we added some extra stuff to it, we didn't really change yields either. So we've tried this about every way we know how. Occasionally you'll see some responses to some of this. It's the consistency that's the problem and the economics. Some of these things just almost can't be economic. This is one, I had to show you this, this is my last data slide, I had to show you this one to show you that I've really come of age as a researcher now, I have yields over 100 bushel, so I can retire. Um, but this was at, this after 12 years of continuous corn at Urbana this last year, 15 inch rows. So we have the top four numbers are kind of interesting. Uh, without nitrogen, fungicide, insecticide gave us a yield boost, and they also, they even gave us more of, a, more of a yield boost if we added nitrogen, or vice versa. So we added 10 bushel there when we put both fungicide and insecticide. By the way, that's two times on, not just once. We're never satisfied to just do this stuff once. And put nitrogen on, you know, we could get yields up there. The reason we do some of these things like lots of nitrogen and fungicide twice is when we hear about contest yields, that's what almost everybody does. Now the advantage of a contest is you are going to get good yields there anyway, and nothing that you put on has to prove that it contributed to yield, right? You just put everything on you can think of, and then you put it on again. Uh, the ones at the bottom there were just some of the more odds and ends type things that we threw in. 
one of my guys that works for me, he was wanted to put some of these in, so we did. And uh, we really couldn't find them giving much of a response. That was on top of fungicide and insecticide two times already. So this is just my rundown, and we're not going to stop on here very long because I've said it all, but what works to increase yields under good weather, good varieties is a given. Earlier planting is a given. Early does include early May. It doesn't shut off. You know, that early has got different definitions for different people. Um, lower or higher seeding rates, sometimes 100,000 plants isn't enough, but we should seed. I think to try to get 120, 125,000 plants. We did the calculation, the last group, uh, 20,000 seeds cost you about $10 right now. So I, I encourage people to think in terms of, okay, if we cut that, our input by $10, you know, is there, what's the risk of losing a bushel and a quarter or something that would be worth $10? Narrow rows is one of our most consistent practices, and two or more previous corn crops, absolutely. We don't know if three or four or five is better. I think that probably at some point it runs out, maybe four or five. Foliar fungicide and insecticide, I just say here, more consistent than the presence or absence of disease or insects would suggest it should be, because usually that's just an absence. On average, in our work, it has not covered its cost when we're just doing it every routinely. And nitrogen fertilizer, we still don't have any evidence that soybeans need help to provide themselves with nitrogen by fixation. And we don't have any way to know when nitrogen will pay. And that one that I showed you from Chillicothe this last year is probably one of the first times in 40 some trials where we actually saw nitrogen pay. And we all know that putting nitrogen at planting time is not a recommended practice. And I don't think it should be yet. Um, but at least it's kind of interesting to look at. And stuff or systems, foliar nutrients, poultry litter, gypsum, etc. Put it on if you believe in it. Don't if you don't. And you'll probably not know any difference uh, in yield most of the time. Thanks a lot for your attention. Any last questions here? Is cattle manure going to help soybeans and corn? Right? The question is, cattle manure going to help soybeans and corn? It certainly doesn't hurt it. I've tried to get to that question without, getting, without having to smell it myself, because I smelled it growing up. Um, a lot of people would say it, you know, it doesn't really help, but not many people have looked at it very consistently. What little pieces of research I've seen on it says, you know, if you're paying attention to, to P and K levels and keeping them just in a good range, that it probably isn't going to help very much. We don't know why it would help soybeans, uh, for example. If, uh, you know, it's going to provide some nitrogen, it might help corn with nitrogen in years where it's short. But um, theoretical reasons, I can't come up with a good one. I do know that somebody told me recently most of these corn yield contest winners do use manure. I guess we could use that. But it's like a lot of things they do. There's no evidence that they wouldn't get just as good a yields without it. I think we should look at manure as a good resource and I would count it mostly from the P and K standpoint. Good fertilizer material. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Uh -huh.